Okay. Good. Well, welcome everybody to this press briefing at the joint 48th meeting of the Division of Planetary Sciences and the European Planetary Science Congress. It's noon on Wednesday, the 19th of October. And today, as well as hearing the latest up updates uh, from what's been happening at Mars this morning, uh, we will also be hearing about the search for Planet Nine. I'm Anita Hewitt. I'm the press officer for EPSC, the European Planetary Science Congress, and also in the room we have uh, we have Shantanu Naidu, the DPS press officer, Rick Feinberg at the back uh, from the WAS, who will be taking questions from those of you. Um, who are watching online via the webcast, and Constantine Sang, um, who is the deputy incoming DPS press officer. Could I ask everybody here in the audience to make sure that you've silenced your phones, bleepers, pages, etc., and to hold off your applause until the end of the briefing? Um, we have two press releases today to accompany the talks from Renu and from Mike which you will be able to find online at the Europlanet website, uh, europlanet-eu.org slash press, and I'm sure you should have already received from Rick. So today we have a really packed schedule. I'm sure that you'll have lots of questions. We're going to try and keep it short and to the point. Uh, we have a press briefing starting at 1 o'clock on Juno, so all the speakers will give their presentations and then we'll open it up to questions and we should be finished by 12.45 today. So first up we have Olivier Vitas from the European Space Agency who will be telling us the latest about what we know from the um, Chaparelli landing this morning. Um, we then have Anne-Karine van Dale. Um, who will be talking about Trace Gas Orbiter, which is successfully inserted into orbit around Mars. Then we are looking right to the edge of the solar system, um, and we will hear the latest from uh, Reno Malhotra of the University of Arizona and from Mike Brown of Caltech about the search for Planet Nine. So, Olivier. Good. <clears throat> so I'm Olivier Vitas from the European Space Agency, and I've worked uh, for a few years on Mars missions. So <clears throat> as you can imagine, today is a very uh, special day for me and for ESA and, and for Europe. So this is uh, the standard uh, first slide uh, uh, when we have to make presentation from ESA. And when I saw that I had to use this slide, in fact, that inspired me the, the next slide that would be more appropriate for, for this talk, which is... Uh, Okay, here, which is this one, where in fact illustrates quite well the, the ExoMars mission. So this is Mars, as you can imagine, and this is the thin atmosphere above the surface. And with the ExoMars mission, in particular with the orbiter, we are looking to study the small and thin and tenuous atmosphere above the planet to get some information about the possible activity of the planet either regarding life or from uh, geological processes that occur in the surface. So I thought this slide illustrates quite well the ExoMars mission, and Anne-Karin Vandal will talk to you more about the, the orbiter science objective. So ExoMars is composed of two missions, one in 2016 and one in 2020. And it's, I think it's worth mentioning that it's a joint collaboration between ESA and Roscosmos. I think it's quite an important and great collaboration. So the 2016 mission is composed of an orbiter called the Trust Gas Orbiter, or TGO, and the Scaparelli lander that you see on this picture. And this 2016 mission is driven by three aspects. So first, technology. Uh, because the Scapa Relay Lander has been designed to test key technology about uh, entering the atmosphere, descending, and landing. Then the Trace Gas Orbiter is uh, mainly a science mission, so to study, as I said, the thin atmosphere and to get information on the, about the activity of the planet. And last but not least, this orbiter will also serve as a data relay for surface assets for the next few years. So when we designed the, we, when we designed the 2016 mission, it was driven by these three objectives, and that complicates, complicated a lot the design and the development of the mission. The second part of the mission is the 2020 mission, 
and that's mainly a rover here built by the ESA and the European industry with the main objective to search for signs of uh, past or present life on Mars and also to study the subsurface environment at the uh, place of the rover. There are also some technology objectives associated to that, like uh, uh, roving for a few kilometers and also drilling in the surface uh, down to two meters. And in addition, uh, we have the surface platform, which is built by the Russian, because the Russian colleagues are uh, designed a system to land on Mars. And this surface platform will be also equipped with some sensors to perform some science about surface and surface environment. So the Schiaparelli, which is one of the big topics of today, so this is the lander, so you see an image here, and I would like to focus on the scientific aspect of this lander uh, now. So we have here uh, a set, uh, we don't see here on the screen, but there is a set which is called Dreams Edge, Met Wind, and so on. This is an environmental sensor to study properties of the atmosphere like the wind, the dust properties, the humidity, and the pressure. And in addition, you see in the middle a golden uh, sensor, a golden uh, mast, uh, which is 40 centimeter high, and that's a unique experiment to measure for the first time electric field on the surface. So we hope that the landing will be successful because from this, there will be very interesting measurements that have never been carried before. And as it is illustrated on the right and bottom side, we want to measure electric field which can be generated by dust friction in the atmosphere. And that will be very important for the future exploration as a robotic or human exploration. There is also uh, uh, on this uh, um, uh, lander a very interesting piece of hardware, which is a retro re 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 reflector, which could be used to reflect a laser from orbiter just to test some uh, positioning at Mars. And last but not least, there is also a camera, which is called DECA, descent camera, which hopefully uh, took some uh, 15 images during the descent, and hopefully we'll get these images later today or tomorrow. That's the image of, uh, of the matting between the orbiter and the lander. So you see the size of those two elements. And they were matted together just a few weeks before launch in Baikonur. Then they cruised together to Mars. And then they were separated on Sunday, as is illustrated on this image. And TGO point, uh, sent so the Schiaparelli to the surface of Mars, and then later TGO made a raising maneuver to be inserted correctly into orbit. So that's the sequence of uh, what happened this morning at 8 o'clock local time here. So there was a complex, a complex sequence with first entering the atmosphere, decelerating in the atmosphere thanks to the heat shield, then parachute deployment. Then uh, jettison of the heat shield, jettison of the parachute a few minutes later, then ignition of uh, liquid propellant uh, thrusters, and two meters above the surface, the thrusters stopped working, and then there was a free fall of about two meters, such that the landing occurred at a speed of about a few kilometers per hour. And the full sequence took between six and seven minutes. This is a famous, these are the famous six minutes of terror. And you have heard this morning that we tried to get some uh, telemetry and signal from, uh, from this sequence. And in fact, during all this sequence, the lander was sending a signal mainly to the orbiters above, above the EDM, the, the lander. But also, we wanted to test an experiment to receive the signal directly from Earth using an Indian radio telescope, which was visible at the time of the landing. And that would have been the main source of information. And indeed, we received a signal that indicates clearly that the lander entered the atmosphere, was uh, deployed the parachute, and separated the heat shield. So we have at least this information. Uh, unfortunately, we, we got a, lot, a loss of signal a few minutes just before the expected landing. So this is where we are. And this was confirmed by the Mass Express data, which also received the signal. Uh, so we don't know exactly what happened uh, a few minutes or seconds before landing. And we are waiting for more information, in particular the telemetry, so the data that we recorded during the descent. And we should get this information by first by a NASA Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and hopefully we'll get more information in a few uh, hours from now. This is to show the place of the landing. So this is a map of Mars where 
if you uh, are knowledgeable about Mars, you recognize some features like the Grand Canyon and some uh, big volcanoes. And you see the, the landing site, the Schiaparelli, which is very close to the Opportunity NASA rover. And so as the conclusion, uh, we can say that today is a great day for, for ESA and for Europe. We have first a successful uh, Mars orbit insertion for the TGO orbiter. Uh, so that's great. We have two uh, European uh, orbiter around Mars. So that's great news. And Han Karin will tell you about the science that we can do with that. About the Scapa Ready lander, uh, we have to wait. At the moment, what we can say is the, the mission is not nominal, but it's too early to speculate about what happened, and we should get more information uh, in the next hour, so we hope for the best, of course. Thank you very much, and I, I hand over to Anne Karin. So indeed, I will talk a uh, little more um, on the TGO, so satellite uh, in orbit around Mars, and more specifically on uh, my instrument, which is called NOMAD. Uh, so this is uh, an illustration of uh, where the different instruments are located on the um, uh, spacecraft. Uh, in fact, we are four instruments on board. Two are Russians, ACS and FRAND, and then two European, uh, NAMAD and CASIS. And CASIS is a, a high-resolution camera which will take a, a picture uh, to give the context of the, the science we will derive. Uh, so NOMAD, uh, the main goal is to study the atmospheric composition and uh, in, in that way improve the climatologies that we have uh, of Mars. It's uh, composed of three uh, channels. Two are working in the infrared. One is optimized to do solar occultations, so looking at the sun as it sets and uh, get up uh, through the atmosphere. Um, one is optimized for nadir looking, so looking directly at the planet, and the other, uh, the third channel is uh, UVs, who, uh, which can do both kind of measurements. So what do we want to achieve with this instrument? And in fact, one of the other uh, Russian instruments called ACS has uh, similar uh, science objectives. We want to um, uh, of course, we know already a lot about uh, Martian atmosphere, but we need more details. Uh, we need to understand the complexity and the globality of the atmosphere, and this will be done uh, by having access to the chemical composition of the atmosphere. That's why we are using infrared and UV to cover a very wide um, um, coverage of different molecules. Um, we will, in, in, in fact, uh, extend the climatology and the knowledge we have on seasonal cycles. You know that Mars has been uh, studied for a long time now and we need to have a future mission to extend our knowledge on longer time frame. And then uh, the most important uh, aspect is to combine all this and to derive uh, uh, more knowledge about the sources and the sinks. Uh, this uh, is done uh, mainly through um, modeling, uh, integrating all the measurements into models. So what's the, the status? So you all heard that today uh, TGO uh, arrived at Mars. The separation, as uh, Olivier said, was in fact done on Sunday. Uh, separately landed uh, in some way on the surface, we will know more uh, later, and uh, the insertion of TGO around Mars has been confirmed. So uh, we know, uh, are sure, 
that uh, the spacecraft is orbiting, orbiting um, the planet. So what will happen in near future? In fact, uh, we will have uh, some possibilities to do some real measurements while, while we are, in fact, waiting. Waiting for what? To have the good conditions of the spacecraft and environmental to start the arrow breaking. So this is a, um, a slow way to get into the final uh, orbit, which will be circular, and this is illustrated uh, in the figure uh, top, uh, no, bottom uh, right. Um, and uh, this arrow breaking will take about one year, so the real science phase uh, will start end of 2017. But we will do some uh, measurements. We have been uh, um, allowed to, uh, to operate during two orbits, meaning uh, eight days, because the orbit is very uh, large and elliptical. And uh, during those two orbits, we will uh, do real science, so uh, looking at Mars nadir, so directly to the planet, uh, during the night side and during the, the day side. Of course, there will be a lot of calibration, looking at the sun, looking at the dark sky. Um, and on orbit two, uh, we would like to um, take the opportunity to look at Phobos, who will be um, seeable from the orbit we have. And of course, again, do observation of Mars. And we have to say that uh, we hope uh, this is yeah, we, we hope to have uh, simultaneous observations with NASA uh, spacecrafts such as MAVEN or MRO uh, and on the, on the surface uh, Curiosity and from the other um, European spacecraft around Mars, MEX, Mars Express. So uh, just an illustration of uh, how we will achieve our goal. So we are looking at Nadia. This means that we will do mapping. And you have here some uh, illustration on how good our coverage will be. So the top um, figure illustrates the, uh, the tracks uh, about, uh, after four hours of uh, measurements and the bottom one after four days. So you see that we will have a, a very um, global coverage of uh, the planet. Uh, but we will also uh, do uh, solar occultation, and this will give us information on the vertical, uh, how the uh, gases evolve with altitude. Um, all this, of course, uh, will um, be done to have a global uh, image of the, uh, the Martian atmosphere, and one of the um, aim of the mission, which at some point will was called the methane mission, is of course to confirm the presence of uh, methane and to confirm the, the observation made by Curiosity uh, those uh, last month. So thank you for uh, your attention. Uh, I suppose I give the word to the next speaker. Good morning, or good, good afternoon, I suppose. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm uh, telling you about a paper that I presented at the DPS. And uh, that work is based on a paper that was published in uh, AppJ uh, this, this June. Uh, it's about a uh, little more evidence for the ninth planet. Uh, we've heard about the ninth planet since the beginning of this year. It's, uh, I, I imagine that most of you have heard about it. Has anybody not heard about it? Should I go through the background? Okay, I'm hearing laughter, so that tells me that everyone's familiar with it. Uh, so I won't, I'll skip the background. Um, Anita told me to keep this to five minutes, so I'm going to go through this pretty fast. So the extra, uh, we looked at this from a different angle, if you like. Uh, the, the thing that we noticed was um, that the longest, some of the longest period Kuiper Belt objects, these so-called extreme Kuiper Belt objects, uh, what that means is that these are very far away. They have very long orbital periods, typically many thousands of years uh, to go around the sun. And uh, they have very elongated orbits. They are highly elliptical orbits. Uh, we noticed that uh, the four longest period ones have uh, periods relative to each other that are in near integer ratios. And you can see those integers 
here on the on the side. Uh, I guess the cursor doesn't show up there. Okay, never mind. On the right side of this table, you can see that the uh, period ratios are close to integers. And uh, that's actually not very significant physically unless there's a planet that's, uh, that they are in uh, orbital resonances with. And so the, these uh, low integer ratios are naturally explained or most naturally explained if the Kuiper Belt objects are in resonances with an unseen massive planet. And interestingly enough, it turns out that uh, semi-major axis of this planet of 665 astronomical units puts it into, uh, makes these, uh, these Kuiper Belt objects have very simple orbit period ratios with the planet. Uh, so if we make the hypothesis that the period of this planet is three and a half times Sedna's orbital period, then um, you can see here in, in an illustration uh, that the, there's that big planet on the upper illustration and a smaller planet on the lower illustration. Bigger planets will make bigger resonance widths. Smaller planets will make narrower resonance widths. Now the periods of these Kuiper belt objects are not super well determined, so there's some uncertainty in exactly what their period ratio would be. So if we choose, uh, if we specify a period ratio, or a period of the planet, and uh, we ask uh, that the uncertainties that we have for the orbital periods of the Kuiper belt objects are lie within these integer ratios with the planet, then we can get a sense, uh, an estimate of the mass of the planet. And that turns out to be, the answer turns out to be that if the mass of the planet is more than about 10 Earth masses, the uncertainties in these orbital periods are small enough that they will be in these orbital resonances with the planet. Uh, another interesting thing we can figure out about this planet by uh, looking at these uh, resonances is uh, another geometrical property uh, which they might share with Pluto. Now, this is with, re with regards to what is the orbit plane of this planet. Is, in, is it in the plane of the solar system or close to it? Or is it highly uh, tilted relative to the plane of the solar system? We don't really know. Uh, we have these hints that these Kuiper Belt objects generally tend to have quite a large dispersion in their orbital planes, uh, as do these uh, most distant Kuiper Belt objects. Their inclinations range over several tens of degrees to the plane of the solar system. And interestingly, the, the thing that I honed in on was uh, this geometry that's illustrated by Pluto. Pluto, you can see, has an inclined orbit relative to the plane of the solar system. And it has a particular, um, another resonance. We don't, it's not very intuitive. But uh, every time Pluto gets to perihelion, it's away from the plane of the solar system. So this geometry is called, uh, it was identified by Henri Poincaré more than 100 years ago uh, in the, three-body problem, the famous three-body problem, and they're called periodic orbits of the third kind. Now, if we ask that if uh, that these, uh, these distant Kuiper Belt objects, which might be in resonances with this planet, might also share this kind of um, special uh, geometric property, and there are reasons to think that the, these kinds of orbits might be preferred. So if we ask that all of these distant Kuiper Belt objects are in this periodic orbits of the third kind, then we can find the sweet spot inclined plane of the planet, which turns out to be tilted about uh, 48 degrees to the mean plane of the solar system. So we are really expanding, uh, allowing our imagination to, um, to allow all kinds of uh, dynamical um, preferences that, uh, that these, uh, these orbits might have. So this is one possible plane. It's not secure, but this would put these uh, distant Kuiper Belt objects in these special uh, relationships with uh, the planet. Uh, and I think I will, um, another thing about the mean motion resonance, the value, the huge value of the mean motion resonances is that they provide a special relationship between where the planet is in its orbit relative to the perihelion direction of each of these resonant um, uh, Kuiper Belt objects. And that means we can rule out certain places in the orbit, in the sky, where the planet cannot be. And that's in these uh, two traces that I've drawn on the plane of the sky. Uh, the green curve, the green and black curve is for a low inclination orbit, which is allowed, and a high inclination orbit, the special one, that's also allowed. Uh, so the, the colored parts are where the planet can be, the black parts are where it's ruled out to be on the, on the plane of the sky. And uh, this, is, this summarizes all these points that I've just made. Um, my uh, contact information is here. I'm at the University of Arizona. There's my email address, and I'd be happy to answer questions, or you can email me your questions.
Hi, I'm, I'm Mike Brown. I'm uh, really the spokesman for this talk. Um, this is based on a talk that some of you might have seen in a session yesterday given by Elizabeth Bailey, who's here in the, uh, the front row. She's a graduate student at Caltech working with me and also Constantine Batigan, who's here in the front row. Um, you see a title like The Search for Planet Nine, and I know you think I'm going to be talking about telescopes and, and blinking little things across the sky. And in fact, I'm not going to talk about telescopes and blinking little things across the sky right now because because right now, the, the search for Planet Nine is as much about understanding the effects of Planet Nine on the solar system, understanding the physics of Planet Nine to help us understand where it is as it is going to the telescopes and, and staring at the sky. So we think that by spending more of our efforts right now refining our models, refining our understanding, we can make it easier for not just ourselves, but for everybody else who we're, who we're sharing our results with to be able to find Planet Nine in the near future. So the, the real title for this is not the search for Planet Nine. It's the, uh, it is, it is search for all of the things that Planet Nine does to the solar system. Um, of which there are many, but uh, this is the one that I think is the most astounding and most fun. Um, so the story starts, now, anybody who was at the talk yesterday is not allowed to answer, but I'm gonna do a quick quiz, which is, does anybody know, first off, the, I'll tell you the planets, the planets are all in one plane in the solar system. There's a, there's a variation of about one degree between the planets. Does anybody know w how much the sun is tilted compared to that plane? Who was not at the talk yesterday? You were at the talk yesterday. You gave the talk yesterday. Anybody know? Nobody knows. See, this is, this is such a central mystery in the solar system that nobody even talks about it anymore. So the sun, the sun is tilted by six degrees compared to the planets. And if you, if you look at it, it's, it's, uh, six degrees is not a lot, but it's enough that you can just, you see that it's, it's, uh, it's going just a little bit like this. The planets are all almost exactly in one plane. And we think that the planets and the sun all form in the swirling gas disk um, spinning around. There is no reason uh, that you wouldn't think they started out exactly the same. So it's, uh, it's been this, this mystery from the 1850s of why this would be different. Turns out, if there is a massive Planet Nine in the outer solar system on an inclined orbit, uh, come on, massive Planet Nine. All right, go. There we go. So here's, here's what's gonna, uh, what, what you're gonna see. So the, the blue line here is Planet Nine now. The red line is the north pole of the, the solar system, basically the, you know, the, the pole of the direction that the planets all go around the sun, and the yellow line is the pole of the sun. They start out exactly the same. The solar system and the sun start out the same, but planet nine is tossed out in this orbit that's tilted by, in this case, about 30 degrees. The interesting thing about planet nine, it's so far away that it, gets, it essentially gets this huge lever arm on the solar system, and it slowly tilts the planets in its direction. It tries to tilt it, it's the planets in its direction, but it ends up being a precession, just like the uh, top precesses as you spin it. And if you watch, you have to watch carefully because it's slow and it takes something like four billion years to happen. But as you watch, planet nine itself is precessing towards us in this simulation. And you can see that the red line there is the plane of the solar system, it's starting to peel away from the sun because it's trying to follow planet nine and process around it that way. And if you notice now, the red line and the yellow line, the yellow line again is the sun, the red line and the yellow line are distinct. And if you look at the red circle, the red circle is the plane of the solar system. And you can see now the plane of the solar system has tilted. It's now tilted compared to where it started. The sun hasn't tilted, the solar system is tilted, but if you put the, if you, if you live on the Earth, you think that the solar system is straight and you put the solar system straight up and down now, and it's not that the, it's now that the sun, whoops, not good at driving this, here we go. We did that already. All right, you're supposed to see the, so if you're not watching now with the solar system straight up and down, the sun, you can't see the yellow very well, but you can almost see it. You can, the sun is now tilted by, in this case, uh, nearly exactly six degrees. Um, and if you ask yourself where the sun is tilted in, in real life, there's where it's tilted in real life, and there's where we predict it should be in this one set of simulations in blue, almost exactly where it is. And it's not just the six degrees. The six degrees is fun that it gets the right tilt of the, the sun. It also tilts it in the right direction. 
So we, it's, uh, it could have tilted in any particular direction, but the simulations that we do for this set of Planet Nine configurations put the sun exactly where we know the sun is going to be. This is kind of amazing, actually, if you, if you think about it, because as, as we started out this, when we realized a couple months ago that this was, uh, this was a possibility, that, that not just a possibility, Planet Nine has to tilt the solar system leading to the sun looking tilted. There's no way around it. We knew this was true and we started doing the calculations and we, we did not know what the answer was gonna be. The answer could well have been for our favorite Planet Nine configuration, maybe it tilts the sun by 20 degrees, which would tell us we're just absolutely wrong. It could have told us that it tilted the sun zero degrees and then we would still be left with a mystery of why the sun is tilted. But the amazing thing is, for these uh, very standard parameters that we like to talk about for Planet Nine, it tilts it nearly exactly correctly. Now, why is this good? Um, one is it's just it's kind of cool that Planet Nine tilts the sun, even though it doesn't tilt the sun, but it sounds good. Um, but more importantly, or as importantly, it tells us a couple of things. It tells us that we are, we think, on exactly the right track. Our, our estimates of the orbit have to be essentially correct or we would be getting the wrong value for where, where the sun is uh, and where, where Planet Nine is. Armed with this and armed with uh, some of the other simulations we're working on right now, we have, we have considerably narrowed the search area, even from our, our publication six months ago where we narrowed it down to a, a pretty small area. I think we're down to about a factor of two smaller. We have about 400 square degrees of sky. I'm pretty sure, I think, that uh, by the end of next winter, not this winter, next winter, I think that there'll be enough people looking for it that one of the, I think there's about eight groups that I know of that are looking. I think somebody's gonna actually track this down and, and next one of these we'll be talking about finding Planet Nine instead of just looking for it. So thank you very much to all our speakers. We have been having some technical issues today, but hopefully everything will work during the question and answer session. Um, Journalists here in the room, can you wait until you have the microphone um, and then identify yourself and your affiliation? Who's got a question? Um, Alex? Thank you, Alex with See With Nature. But Olivier, could you take us through the next couple of hours in terms of communication attempts uh, with the lander and especially um, when do we expect to hear from MRO? Well, in fact, so the, uh, <clears throat> Now what we, what we had is the communication with the Indian Telescope and with Mars Express, that's for sure, and the data are being analyzed. The next one is MRO, and in fact, some of the MRO data, in fact, should be already recorded and should be analyzed quite soon. So in fact, we should expect something maybe later today or later tomorrow about the MRO uh, data set, which is quite important because uh, it contains the telemetry. And of course, if you want to understand what is happening, we need to know all the data which are being recorded. Because with the two previous data sets, uh, Mars Express and the Indian Radio Telescope, it's only the signal which give only an indication of what is happening in terms of uh, sequence, entry, parachute deployment, and so on. But what is more important is the, the telemetry, which will come with MRO, in fact, in the next hours or so. And then later, there will be TGO also, the ExoMars Orbiter, which uh, has recorded also some data and will be sent as soon as possible. So tomorrow, we should have at least two uh, hopefully interesting data set to tell us more about what is going on. And then after, I was assuming everything is going okay, there will be several passes with different orbiters, including MAVEN, just to support the, the, the science phase, which uh, by mission design is supposed to last a few days. So in fact, we have already many passes in the, in the planning, which hopefully will be uh, useful. Rick, do we have some questions online? We do indeed. This first one comes from Daniel Fischer of Sky Week in Germany. It's a question also for Olivier. Is it correct, as an ESOC source has told Daniel, that Schiaparelli's signal disappeared rapidly for both the GMRT and the MEX immediately after backshell separation, in other words, pr uh, practically at the moment of thruster ignition? And was there any sharp Doppler signal seen at the very last moment which would indicate a major mechanical malfunction? Well, at the moment, as I said, the only thing we can say is that the mission is not nominal. It's really too early to speculate about possible failure, uh, in particular because the experiment with the, um, the observation of the measurement with the Indian radio telescope was really an experiment, because that, that was to get the signal, the direct signal from, um, 
uh, the, the lender to Earth, which is not a trivial things to do. So what we got as the information is that we got the loss of signal maybe a few minutes before the expected landing. That's all we can say, and it's a bit too early to say whether it uh, was at the time of the ignition of the, of the engine. Emily. Emily Lakdawalla with the Planetary Society. Um, so if the uh, parachute deployment was successful, um, was the uh, DECA imager taking images uh, as far as, well, I, I know we don't know that yet, but uh, was, were the images part of the telemetry that was being transmitted or was, were those images supposed to be transmitted at a later date? Yeah, in fact, the, 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 the images were supposed to be transmitted uh, right after the, the landing, so that we have to, uh, to wait for a hopefully a successful landing to know more about these 15 images that DECA will, uh, will, should have taken. Charles, you had a question. Um, yes, uh, Charles Choi, Scientific American. Uh, this is a question for either uh, Michael Brown or uh, Renu. Um, so there are, uh, have been uh, uh, some papers, uh, uh, Corey Shankman and uh, Samantha Lawler, that suggest that maybe uh, there is observational biases, uh, you know, when it comes to some of the TNOs, or um, and that maybe uh, that suggests that uh, Planet Nine might not exist. I was just wondering what you might, uh, you know, say in response to that, uh, you know, to those papers. So I, I would, yeah, let me let me uh, try this one. So there are um, there are observi observational biases all over the Kuiper Belt. Anytime you look at anything in the Kuiper Belt, you have to make sure that you're understanding your observational biases. And in a, a collection of objects found in a huge different sets of surveys, it's uh, exceedingly hard to quantify what these observational biases are. Um, we think that we have a pretty good handle on it by, by using other objects to quantify our observational biases, and we're not particularly worried about the observational biases. I mean, we're, we always worry about them. We don't think they're affecting the results. I would say more importantly, um, th this would have been something that worried me more a year ago when we were first looking at this. At this stage, we have so many different lines of evidence that there's a massive planet out there that, that if there's not a massive planet out there, then it has to be that there was one there yesterday that just disappeared. I mean, it's, it is really very hard for me to think of how the solar system could be doing all the things it's doing out there without there being a massive planet. Rick, I think we have some more questions online. Yes. Um, Here's a question from Tracy Watson, uh, USA Today for Olivier. Uh, she asks, um, if you establish uh, that the lander didn't touch down safely, uh, how might that affect the 2020 launch date for the rover? Yeah, so assuming there is a failure, but again, as I said, it's too early to, to say that, uh, that will affect, in a way, the, the 2020 uh, rover, but n it's not a one-to-one -one reuse of the technology from the uh, Scaparelli lander to the 2020 ExoMars rover. Because the design of the, of the entry and descent system of the rover has changed over the last few years, and now we are collaborating with Roscosmos. So Roscosmos is designing their own uh, descent uh, and landing system, which will not reuse all the technology from, uh, from Scaparelli. Some of them, but not all of them. So that will impact, but not dramatically, if there is a failure of the EDM Scaparelli. Okay, and there's a few questions here for um, Mike Brown as well. Uh, this first one from Kelly Beatty of Sky and Telescope. Uh, can you remind us where the likely search space is in the sky, and given your assumed distance and mass, how bright you expect Planet Nine might be? Sure, the, the constraints that we have now are, are from uh, knowing what the orbital path is through the sky, so that gives us a swath across the sky to look at, and then also, how bright that we think it is. So there are many places in the sky, even though the, the, the simulations don't show us where in the orbit it is, there are many places in the orbit where we should have seen it already because it'd be so bright. If it's something that's uh, 10 times the mass of the Earth, uh, maybe four times the size of the Earth, it would be a super bright, uh, well, for astronomers, a super bright object if it was at its closest approach. Um, it would be visible to, to people with backyard telescopes at closest approach it would have been found by now. So there are many places we can rule it out as, as, uh, as not being. The one place that we still can't rule out is the place where it's statistically most likely to be anyway, which is at aphelion, its most um, distant part from the sun. 
from our, our best estimates of the orbit, the aphelion distance is probably something around 1,000 AU. Put a 1,000 AU, uh, put, a, put a four Earth-sized object, uh, Earth radius object at 1,000 AU, and you get something like 25th magnitude. Um, 25th magnitude for the, for the non-astronomers, which is probably everybody, um, 25th magnitude is, is faint, but it's actually a perfect magnitude. This is, it is the limit of what we can conveniently do with the biggest telescopes on the Earth. If, if the answer had come out to be that, that I think it's 26th magnitude, we would be sitting here talking about the fact that we won't be able to find it till the next generation of telescopes. This is, this is well within reach of the big, the, the giant telescopes. The Subaru telescope, I think, on, on Mauna Kea, the Japanese National Telescope, is, is the prime instrument for doing the search. But there are a lot of other people who have clever ideas on how to find it, too, that are trying with their own telescopes. Thank you. We've got more questions from Emily. Yeah. Emily Lakdawalla, Planetary Society for Anne. I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit more about the plans for the commissioning of the spacecraft, um, and also if there are any opportunities for science during the aerobraking period. Yes, so uh, in fact, in the coming days, we will have a confirmation of the, the orbits, and then uh, the, the flight dynamics engineers will calculate the best options to start the aerobraking. So that's the main uh, next step for the mission. It's aerobraking, to be ready for it. Uh, that will be a long uh, period, um, dangerous period, because they want to do it very uh, quietly, uh, not to use too many uh, fuel, uh, to have reserve for the last. Uh, uh, as Olivier said, uh, we have to be there for transmitting. Uh, um, from the uh, different um, rover or assets on the on the surface, uh, so fuel is one of the constraints. Uh, concerning the, the two orbits for the science, um, we might have two. Uh, as I said, it, it will be end of November. Again, depending on the uh, final um, calculation of the orbits, uh, we might have one more uh, in January, just before aerobraking. And then, uh, during aerobraking, there will be no signs at all. Rick, do we have a last question from online? I'm going to cheat and squeeze two questions in one. Uh, Nancy Atkinson from Universe Today and Alex Teleshev from RIA Novosti uh, have a couple questions for Mike. Uh, basically, uh, what about what effect do the tilts of the other dwarf planets have on the solar system? And Mike, do you expect to beat Scott Shepard and Chad Trujillo in the search for Planet X? So the, uh, um, the dwarf planets have zero effect on the solar system at all. These dwarf planets are so, so small, so little mass, that, that they are essentially point particles in the solar system. Um, planet Nine is a, is a huge planet. It's approaching the size of Neptune, and because it's that big, uh, it can uh, tilt. Because it's so big and so far away, it gets such a large lever arm that it can tilt the solar system. But even if you put a dwarf planet out at that distance, nothing would happen. Do we expect to beat? Um, no, I don't actually expect to beat anybody. I think that there are, as I said, there are like eight or 10. I, I know of eight, I think there might be 10 groups. Um, I don't think there's any one group I would bet on. People have some, um, some very clever ways they're working on it. Uh, we're doing the same sort of thing that, um, that uh, Trujillo and Shepard are, which is just you know, sort of old school, go to telescope, look at sky. But there are people who are doing interesting archival things. I, I would say that the chance that either we or uh, Trujillo and Shepard find it is, is not particularly high. There are a lot of people looking, and we are trying as hard as we can to tell people where to look. You know, if we had kept it secret, then I would say, yeah, we, we were going to find it before anybody. But, but we want everybody to be looking. We want it to be found as soon as possible. So we're trying to make sure everybody knows where the right spot to look is. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid because we have uh, another briefing starting at one o'clock, um, that's all we have time for today. However, I'm sure that our speakers will be around if you want to ask them further questions or we'll answer your questions via phone or email. So thank you very much to Olivier Vitas, to Anne-Karine Vandel, uh, to Rina Malhotra and to uh, Mike Brown. Um, and please join us again at one o'clock for the press conference on Juno. Thank you very much. Thank you.